Hello, my name is Billy Rewald. I'm from Vienna, an industrial designer. And I'm going to start with a very personal question. Are you comfortable with your productive role? Because I don't really think if I am. Because the imaginativeness of womanhood and childhood and uh, childbearing is very narrow. So in the 1970s, feminist Shulamith Firestone wrote that the unequal distribution of the burdens and limits of human procreation are a source of gender inequality. And half a century later, and since the beginning of time, nothing has changed about these burdens and limits. So this picture, for example, is from the 2009 movie, Star Trek movie. And so the Star Trek movie is playing in the 23rd century. The whole movie is situated there. And brain surgeries are there done within the blink of an eye, completely painlessly, with some kind of technology. But <coughs> women are still screaming in pain and blood due to labor and childbirth. So I ask myself, is the way we bear children still up to date, or could we maybe process to a more equal way of procreation? And ectogenesis is the evolving of a human being from conception to birth completely outside uh, a human swamp. Um, but ectogenesis is imprinted a little dystopic due to films like Matrix or books like Brave New World. Um, let's say it has a very bad reputation. But the whole topic is not that science fiction anymore. If we look at the normal gestation period of about 14 weeks, we will see that there are a lot of things already happening outside the human's body. If we look at in vitro fertilization on the one hand side, where there is already six, week, uh, six days of embryonic development outside the human's body before it gets re-implanted into the woman's womb, and we have 14 days of legal embryonic research on this side, and on the other hand side we have incubators as part of the neonatal intensive care units, which are very common. So. These two technologies are leaving us with a gap of 20 weeks, so only half the pregnancy left. And due to bringing earlier premise to, to term, um, scientists are already uh, developing some kind of artificial world, uh, worms. And on some point in history, this technology on the, other, on the one hand side will reach the 14 days legal border on the embryonic research and full human ectogenesis will be possible then. And I think it's better to think about this possibility before technology prescribes it. Because rather than a dystopia, this could be a super utopia, because maybe ectogenesis is, is enabling us to distribute the burdens and limits <coughs> of human procreation more equal equally because procreation could be accessible for everyone. Since fertility is a very huge topic, because education periods are getting much longer and um, family planning is kept on the hold, so we are kind of missing out on our naturally designed slots for reproduction. And fertility and infertility treatments and rates are rising, and so is the so-called fertility tourism to countries where surrogacy is allowed. And surrogacy in itself is some kind of extracorporeal pregnancy as well, because someone else is carrying your offspring. Nowadays, you can be biological, genetic, or social parent. Biological meaning you're the one carrying, genetic meaning you're the egg or the sperm donor, or social meaning you're the one raising the child. So every and each of these parts can be done by another person, also the biological, so the carrying. But I ask myself, why would it be better to use another human being as a container for your offspring when you could use a machine that you can control? 
With that question in mind, I started to dig deeper into the research and uh, started to speak with a lot of medics uh, about this topic. And the first one that did wrote me back was uh, Monika Daubner. She is the head of the Midwifery Committee in Austria. And the first question I asked her was why she wanted to speak with me. And she said, yeah, well, someone has to say something against this because this could never happen. So kind of a rough start into the conversation. And I went on and spoke with uh, Peter Wolf Huslan from the Medical University in Vienna. And he at least pointed out that ectogenesis could be possible in some future, but he would rather not want this to happen. And the conversation stayed rough with neonatologist uh, Angelika Berger, um, who stated that she's finding the idea grotesque. But I thought, due to their profession, what they could think of and what they could not think of was kind of limited. And I thought of um, creating something that would replace this dystopic imprint of ectogenesis. And of course, design was the perfect tool to do so. So this is a picture of a mock-up, which I did, an uh, early mock-up, which I did to um, find out what parts of a machine or such a machine would need and where it could be situated when the melon is a child in this case. <coughs> um, but this picture became key in, in, in visualizing and communicating my vision on how the aesthetics would be that I wanted to achieve. And then I also found Maria Lemowski, who is a film producer of the film Future Baby, who already did bespoke the possibility of ectogenesis in one of her movies. So we could skip the whole explanation part, and I was finally able to ponder upon details about the machine. I wanted to create a design that could reach everyone and involve anyone into the discussion. Therefore, I created AVA. And AVA consists of three main compartments. The amniotic fluid cycle and filter on the one hand side, and the vital system on the other hand side, which is recreating the mother's blood flow. And of course, the main part, the sphere where the baby is in. So under the, surf, uh, uh, un under the soft surface mesh, um, which is mimicking the abdominal wall, the child is floated in artificial amniotic fluid and uh, protected by a hard shell, which is also um, showing the vital systems in terms of the haptic feedback of the heartbeat. And the child is plugged into the vital system through the um umbilical cord bin into the artificial placenta, which is, which is also involving alongside with the baby. And to keep the bonding, again, technology is used to transfer the heartbeat and the sounds and the movements from the baby to the parent and the other way around. And within the moment that, that uh, AVA was finally created, I invited a lot of people to talk to me again about the project with AVA in the same room. And suddenly the conversation opened up a little and uh, ectogenesis was finally thinkable for them. They touched the machine like as they would touch a human's body. And this reverent way of them interacting with the machine, that was very joyful for me to see because suddenly people could see what I was seeing. And yeah, and <laughs> um, at the last exhibition, I really liked to stay uh, in the room with the machine to talk uh, about with strangers about the project, but also to co collect opinions and reactions on the machine. And one of these reactions was um, out of a silence, a man uh, came and, and, and asked his female companion, but what's the point in being a woman then? And personally, I think this question should not remain unanswered. But ectogenesis does not aim to give answers, but to illustrate a potential reality and spark a debate about the burdens and limits, but also the future of human procreation. Thank you.